Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians 10 is one of the most important chapters in the New Testament in understanding the Old Testament. It's one of the most important chapters in the New Testament in understanding the Old. And we read the following. Verse 1, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink but they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was the Messiah. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, that we should not crave evil things as they craved. Nor be idolaters, as some of them were, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, stood up to play, nor act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them as an example and were written for our instruction. In verse 6 and in verse 11, we are told the Old Testament history of Israel was written so we as believers would not make the same mistakes. It is similar to what is written in Romans chapter 15, that what was written in former times, the Old Testament, was written for our instruction. Two-thirds of the Bible, actually nearly 70%, the Old Testament, God's dealing with Israel, was written that we would learn from it with a specific emphasis on not making or repeating the errors. Not only is the church good at repeating the errors of Israel, they're good at amplifying them. It begins with the Exodus. Paul tells us how to interpret the Exodus of the Jews. Egypt is a metaphor for the world in the Bible. It's a picture of Satan's kingdom. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan, the god of the world. The Egyptians deified him. As Moses made a covenant with blood, the blood of the lamb, and sprinkled it on the people, and led the children of Israel out of Egypt through the water into the promised land, is a picture of the way Jesus covers us with the blood of the lamb, and leads us through baptism out of the world into heaven. One is the picture of another. But it has a future meaning. Pharaoh is not simply a picture of Satan. He's a type, a shadow of the Antichrist to come. The way that Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron is a way, picture of the way, the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. Those same judgments you see in the book of Exodus are replayed or they're recapitulated in the book of Revelation. And in fact, they're commemorated in the Jewish Passover liturgy, the Haggadah, every year when you fill up the plate with the drops of judgment. Hoshek, darkness, Twadaya, frogs, dam, blood. This is the cup of God's wrath in Revelation being filled up. So the book of Exodus is a past event But it's a picture of our salvation, something very present, but it's also a picture of something future. The reason they brought Joseph's bones with them out of Egypt is because the dead in Christ rise first. It's a picture of the rapture and resurrection. The Exodus is a picture of the rapture and the resurrection. It is past, it is present, and it's future. When they came out of Egypt, they came out of the domain of Pharaoh, that is true. But they had not yet entered the promised land. And so, too, we have come out of Egypt. We've come out of the world. We've come out from under the controlling power of Satan, but he's still coming after us. The way the horse and the rider were thrown into the sea, that is a picture of the judgment of Satan. It's why they sing the song of Moses in the book of Revelation. We've come out of the world, but we've not yet entered the promised land. In between Egypt... And the promised land was a sojourning in the wilderness that went on for 40 years. 40 in biblical typology is the number of testing. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights. It rained 40 days in the saga of Noah. David confronted Goliath for 40 days. 40 is the number of testing. 
And so it goes. The Exodus is a picture of what happens when we're saved. We've come out of Egypt, but we haven't entered the promised land. We're covered with the blood of the land. We've gone through the water, but we've not yet crossed the Jordan. We're sojourning in the wilderness. The second generation could enter the promised land, not the first. Only the new creation can go to heaven, not the old. And of course, of all those who came out of Egypt, there was a remnant. One Jew and one Gentile, Caleb and Joshua, entered. Because the faithful remnant will be composed of both Jew and Gentile. With this background in view, turn with me, please, to the book of Exodus chapter 15. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing unto the Lord. He's highly exalted. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength in song. He's become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. We all know the chorus. I will sing unto the Lord. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, also has become my salvation. And, of course, we sing this in the book of Revelation because, again, it is a future event as well. It is the judgment of destruction of Antichrist and of Satan. The destruction of Pharaoh and his armies is a picture of the destruction of the demon cohorts of hell with Satan and the Antichrist. But they begin their sojourn, and the story goes on. In verse 21... 20, Miriam, Moses' sister, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, picks up a tambourine, a timbrel, in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. And Miriam answered, Sing to the Lord, he's highly exalted, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. When we first become believers, when someone is first saved, it's a big celebration. Why shouldn't it be? The enemy's experienced the defeat. We've experienced the liberation. And the angels of heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. Why should we not celebrate? There is much to celebrate. It is perfectly appropriate for Miriam to pick up the tambourine and to dance. The problem is, you've not yet reached the promised land. There's a sojourning through the wilderness. Now, this wilderness is not like the Sahara. It is not even like California's deserts. It's more like, I suppose, New Mexico, where you have beautiful mesas and things like that. The Sinai at places like the Hab and Shadam el Sheikh, it's very pretty, particularly at sunrise and at sunset. The way the sun's rays glisten off the facades of the cliff faces all different colors of rocks. It's quite beautiful. It's quite deceptive. It looks alive. It looks thriving. It looks appealing aesthetically. But it is just as deadly as Death Valley. It is just as deadly as the Sahara. By definition, a desert is a place of death. There are scorpions... There are serpents and vultures, the three most common species indigenous to that habitat, scorpions, vultures, and serpents. Jesus himself used all three as metaphors for the demonic, treading on scorpions. The serpent beguiled the woman, you generation of vipers, and of course, where the vultures gather, the body will be. Abraham had to chase the vultures away. Demonic attack, preying on the body. I had to train in the army in Israel. My son Eli is in the army in Israel in a combat brigade. But I carried more weight in water than I did bullets. It's so easy to dehydrate. And it's a deceptive kind of heat, similar to California. It can be a dry heat. You don't know you're dehydrating. And they're always yelling at you, tishtay, tishtay, drink, drink. 
take the salt tablets, you can go into heat stroke without knowing it. An electrolyte balance can come upon you very quickly, and you see vultures swarming around, waiting for someone or something to die so they'll have what to eat. <laughs> the vultures are up there. They're always around. You get separated from your unit, you can be in trouble. And so it is when a sheep gets separated from the flock and the wolves are hungry. What does it say in Proverbs 18.1? He or she who remains alone lacks sense. They quarrel against all sound wisdom. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. It's impossible to make it alone. It is the one who deviates, who wanders away from the flock that the vultures are going to devour. They quarrel against all wisdom, it says in Proverbs 18.1. No matter what reason someone is giving you for not being in fellowship, for not being committed to a congregation, God says they're quarreling against all sound wisdom. Look at it. I wouldn't want to go to a desert like that on my own. You get in trouble and you're by yourself, you're in real trouble. In fact, it is a virtual death sentence. In Israel, in the army, they had stretcher practice. One soldier would get on the stretcher and feign being wounded and the others would have to carry him. Four others would have to wa walk one kilometer, run a kilometer, walk a kilometer, run a for 40 kilometers. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. People who try to make it through the wilderness and think they can go to heaven without fellowship, what they're really doing is seeking their own desire. They're seeking to gratify their old nature, their old flesh, and no matter what you tell them, no matter what arguments they give you, they're quarreling against all sound wisdom. Now, I know there are sincere believers in certain locations who cannot find a biblically-based church. What should they do? Meet in a home. Meet in a tent. Meet with a couple of other families. But meet. But then the story continues in Exodus chapter 15. The journey begins. Remember, the wilderness is a place of beauty, but a place of death. Oh, they've come out of Egypt, but they've not yet entered the promised land. There's an allure to it. It can look appealing, but it's death. There are mirages. You think you see something, but it's not real. It's like Hollywood. It's like the bright lights of Broadway or Las Vegas. It's an illusion. It can attract us, can appeal to us, but it's an illusion. It's like love from a prostitute. It's not real. It's phony. It's stupid. It's delusional. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea in verse 22 and they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. In that kind of a climate, three days is about as long as you can survive without going into clinical dehydration and collapsing of heat stroke. In other words, God allows his people to be pushed to the absolute limit. <laughs> He will never give us more than we can handle in his strength. But he will push us to the limit. And when they came to Merah, they could not drink the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Merah. Now, let me explain something from the Hebrew text. Merah and Miriam have the same root in Hebrew. Miriam, Mary, it's not really Mary, it's Miriam. That was the mother of Jesus' name as well. It means bitterness. Remember Simeon's prophecy, a sword will pierce your own heart? So there's a play, word play in the Hebrew text between the name of Miriam and the water. The same one who's rejoicing now <laughs> is now in a place of bitterness. That is the way the Christian sojourn in this life is. 
It's a combination of celebration, but bitterness. Joy, but disappointment. And you can go from one to the other very quickly. One of the things you learn after you've been saved a while is don't get discouraged in a valley and don't get overly optimistic on a mountain. (laughs) When you're on the mountain, you can see Mount Zion in the distance. That's the end of the road. But in between Mount Zion, there's other mountains and valleys. The older you're saved, the more you realize don't become overly optimistic about mountaintop experiences And don't become overly discouraged about valleys. (laughs) Till we reach the end of the road. Till we reach the promised land. Till we get to Mount Zion. Then it will all be fun and games. In the meanwhile, there's a journey ahead of us. So they go three days. Water. 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 Oh, thank God. There it is. Water. Ah. It's empty. (laughs) Oh, there's some real water. Look. But it's stagnant. It's bitter. It is alive with bacteria. It is undrinkable. You see, there's no light at the end of the tunnel when you go through a serious valley experience, through a season of serious trials. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's more dark at the end of the tunnel. Things get worse before they get better. Then comes the light. (laughs) It's always darkest before the dawn. We experience a big disappointment. You think it's over. You think that's it. Oh, my ship has come in. Then it sinks at the dock. (laughs) So the people grumbled at Moses. What shall we drink? (laughs) When things get tough, people always turn against the pastor and against the leadership. You can't see God, but we can see him. (laughs) The fact that Moses was struggling with them, the fact that he spent 40 years in that same wilderness knowing how to survive, they don't take that into consideration. All they know is they've got it tough and they have to blame somebody. They're angry at God, and they're angry at God's representative. Now, how did God get them through it? Well, They had the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit that led them, but there was also a sanctified human element. Remember, the pastor, Moses, was a shepherd. The Hebrew word for pastor and shepherd is the same word. Ro'e, Adonai Ro'e, Yahweh is my shepherd. Literally, Psalm 23. Moses had spent 40 years again in that same wilderness as a shepherd of Midian. God sanctified his human experience. Then God used it to enable him to lead a whole nation of 1.5 million people, plus plus adults, plus their children, Egyptian stragglers and cattle with them to the promised land. They turn against the leadership. What shall we drink? Well, pastor, what do you want to do now? You got us into this mess. Then he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters And the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and a regulation, and there he tested them. And said, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I'll put none of the diseases on you which I put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. You will not come under the same judgment as the unbelievers if you listen to the Lord. What are we going to drink? We've been pushed to the limit. Now we get to this water and it's poison. God shows him a tree. Another brief lesson in Hebrew. A tree growing in the ground is called, in Hebrew, Eitz. Eitz. Tree of life. Eitz Hayim. Eitz tree. 
But anything made of a tree, wood, is also called etz in Hebrew. This is etz. A pencil is called etz. Guitar, this is etz. Table, etz. Etz. And the Torah says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on an etz. When the Lord Jesus went to the cross in my place and in your place, he who knew no sin became sin because he took ours. He became a curse on our behalf. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The eighth, the tree, is a picture of the cross. What do you do when the waters of life become too bitter to drink? The Lord will always point us to the cross of Jesus. It was the eighth, the tree, that had the capacity to absorb the toxins out of the water and to make the bitter sweet. Life can be very bitter, very embittering. It can really get to you. It can certainly get to us emotionally. It can get to us spiritually. It can just get to us. And God will allow it to get to us for his purposes. When that happens, don't look at the poison water. Look at the cross. Only the cross can make the bitter sweet. Why should God become a man and die in place of someone like me? Only the cross can make the bitter sweet. The cross is the only solution when the bitter experiences of our sojourn cave in on us. But it says there he tested them, as we pointed out in the first service, when God tests us, it's never to find out if we're going to be faithful. God already knows. He wants us to know if we're going to be faithful. And he wants other people to know. Let the leaders be tested. Unless somebody has sojourned in the wilderness themselves, as Moses did, they're unfit to be a pastor. Only then do they have the credentials to be God's agent to guide and direct others through a hostile environment. But let's continue. Then they came to Elim, verse 27, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms. And they camped there next to the water. Elim, the place of refreshing. In the sojourning of this life, we will go through times at Meta and times at Elim. Times when the waters will be bitter, times when the waters will be sweet. Sometimes the Lord will bring us to a true oasis. Other times he will bring us to a place of stagnation. But here they arrive at the springs of water that were Maim Hayim, fresh and living. Twelve springs and seventy date palms. Notice the 12 and the 70. Remember, this is a type of the church. How did the church begin? With the 12 and the 70, didn't it? It's a picture of our soul journey. There they are, the 12 and the 70. Now things get sweet. Notice it's an experiential roller coaster. I have sing unto the Lord, for he has cried and woman. Moses, you rotten louse, what are you going to drink? Oh, the water's so sweet, have a date. Right off the tree. <laughs> That's the way it is, Jack. Get used to it. <laughs> Sometimes the water will be stagnant. Sometimes the water will be sweet. Sometimes you'll be at a Mara, and sometimes you'll be at an Elam. Be times of blessing, times of testing, times of trial, times of victory. 
times of disappointment, times of triumph, times of Mera, and times of Elam. That's life. However, when we fail a test, something happens. We go through the same test again and again and again until we get it right. You blow it this time, it'll happen again. You lose your temper with your wife, she's going to get on your nerves next Tuesday worse than the last time. <laughs> when I'm stuck in a traffic jam in England and I want to get a bazooka out of the trunk, <laughs> I begin to lose it. Whenever we blow it, it'll happen again and again and again. It's like a chisel that God files down our old nature to make us more conform to the image of likeness of Christ. If you like that, you're a psycho. You're a masochist. You're a loony bird. On the other hand, if you don't realize it's a necessary evil and God's working on our lives, you're no less daft. That's the way it is with us. So they set out from Elam and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. It doesn't mean sin, it's just a word. Of Israel, and they came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai where the law was given. On the 15th day of the second month, after their departure from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation grumbled against Moses <laughs> and Aaron in the wilderness. Yes, they attack Pastor Tom and Pastor Bob. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. We sat by the pots of meat. We used to eat bread to the full. But you brought us to this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. <laughs> yeah, something like that. When you go through trials, the world begins to look good. They forget that they were slaves in Egypt, making bricks for Pharaoh. If you're here today and you're not born again, you're a slave. He who commits sin is slave to sin. You're making bricks for Pharaoh. Everybody goes through the water. It's appointed to man once to die and after this the judgment. But God's people come out. You're just going down. Unless, of course, you also avail yourself of the blood of the Lamb and join the rest of us on our sojourn to the promised land. They begin to long for Egypt. Turn with me, please, to the book of Numbers. Chapter 11, verse 4. And the rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone, and there's nothing to look at except this manna. Now John chapter 6 tells us, this manna is Jesus coming to us in the form of his word. We remember how good we had it in Egypt. Yes, I had a Harley Davidson 1300 motorcycle, fully chopped by a hell's angel. Yes, I had two girlfriends in college and all the cocaine I could scoop up my nose. What have I got now since I became a Christian? Mano. Crazy. The old creation longs for the world and the things of the world. When things get tough, we begin thinking how good we had it in the world. How good unsaved people seem to have it. Why do Christians so often have it tougher than unsaved people? 
Why do the wicked prosper? Jeremiah wondered about that. So did Job. Why do they have it so good? Why do the unsaved have such a good time in this life? But then I perceived their end. (laughs) For them, it ends at the grave. For us, that's where life begins. For us, that's where our trouble ends. For them, that's where their trouble begins. God only corrects his children. He does not correct the children of wrath. But of course we have an old nature that longs for Egypt. When things get tough in the wilderness, the world looks pretty good. Could be a showgirl in Vegas. A high roller. Whatever you want. The world looks good. All we've got is this manna. The story goes on and on and we've all read it, I expect. And in fact, God gave them everything they needed and required to get through the wilderness. The first thing he gave them was his own presence in the ark, where the Shekinah was. The ark was made of wood covered with gold because Jesus would be fully human and fully divine. And the Shekinah dwelt there. His own presence Second thing he gave them were shepherds after his own heart. Good pastors, Moses, Aaron, Caleb, Joshua, Phineas. Third thing he gave them is his word. On Mount Sinai, they got the Torah. That was the third thing he gave them. His own presence, faithful, experienced leaders, and Scripture. A road map to get you from A to B. A road map to get you from Egypt to the promised land. A road map to get you from the road to hell on the road to heaven. Fourth thing he gave them, each other. Fellowship. Again, you don't want to sojourn through a wilderness by yourself. But here's the deal. Lawrence of Arabia made that same journey with a couple of accomplices in a few weeks. It took them 40 years. From A to B is a fixed distance. But when you grumble and complain and rebel, you wind up going around in circles. (laughs) You don't seem to make much progress. How much closer can you be to experiencing the blessings and purposes of God, but you keep going in circles? (laughs) Take your eyes off the map. That's what's going to (laughs) happen. He gave them everything they needed. Sometimes they experienced tremendous miracles. Other times... There were no miracles. Sometimes there were incredible healings. Other times, people they loved and cared about, like Miriam and Aaron, gave up the ghost. Sometimes there were incredible victories. Other times, very sad disappointments. Sometimes, remarkable blessings. Other times, difficult trials and testings. Sometimes, the Shekinah moved in power. Other times, the Shekinah did not move at all. That's the way it's going to be in your life and in my life, in your family and my family, your marriage, my marriage, and in your church and my church. That's the way it's going to be. There will be times when we are camped at Meta and times when we are camped at Elam. There will be times when God's Spirit will move conspicuously and in power. 
there will be times when it seems nothing is happening. There will be times when we will see God miraculously intervene even beyond the capacity of medical science and heal people. Other times, there will be people who we love and care about who are going to cash in their chips and meet us on the other side of the Jordan. Sometimes, there will be astounding victories. Other times, very bitter disappointments. That's the way it is. And if we blow it, we go through it again. We take our eyes off the map, we wind up going in circles, making it worse than it has to be. Like Israel, we grumble. Like Israel, we long for Egypt. Like Israel, we turn against the pastors. Just like them. But Paul says, these things were written so we wouldn't do that. We have their example to learn from. And so it is. But the way it was for them is the way it is for us. Yes, we've come out of Egypt. And we are on our way to the promised land. But there is a wilderness in between, a place of death that can look alluring, that can look appealing, that can make us want to wander away from the flock so the vultures will have something to eat. Us. And yes, there will be these times of bitterness and disappointment, stagnation. Other times of blessing. In your life as a Christian, you will undergo times of trial. At other times... Seasons of blessing. Sometimes in this church you will see God's Spirit move in power. Other times it'll seem like it's going nowhere fast. Sometimes you will pray for the sick and they will recover. Other times they're going to snuff it. Sometimes victory. Other times Nothing but hardship. But I'll tell you this. There is one thing they could always be sure of. And it's one thing I have learned over the years of being a believer I can always be sure of. If I never see another miracle, though I expect I shall. If I never see another healing, though I expect I shall. If I never experience another breakthrough, another victory, though I expect I shall. If I never see God move again in mighty power, though I expect I shall. But even if I don't, and when I don't, one thing I may be sure of, and one thing you may be sure of, miracle or no miracle, healing or no healing, victory or no victory, Move of God or no move of God. Blessing or no blessing. No matter what happens, there is one thing of which we may be positive and take for granted every single hour of our Christian lives. No matter what happens and what doesn't. Maybe there'll be a miracle. Maybe there won't. Maybe a healing, maybe there won't. Maybe a blessing, maybe there won't. Maybe a victory, maybe there won't. But of this I can assure you. The manna falls every single day. God bless.